Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, student protesters in Dakar clash with police a day before opposition leader Osman Sonko is due to face trial. He says that he's being politically persecuted. The court case is one of the most pivotal in the country's recent history and unrest is feared as being possibly able to escalate. Also, after three years, a UN-backed fact-finding mission in Libya releases its final report on human rights in the country. It makes grim reading. The situation is deteriorating with a wide array of war crimes and crimes against humanity suspected as having been committed. And the beat goes on. One Nigerian artist is harking back to historical rhythms by getting kids to learn traditional Yoruba percussion before the drums fall silent. But first, shops and banks shut early and schools were closed in Dakar on Wednesday as Senegal prepared for protests in support of the opposition leader, Usman Sonko. Now, he's due in court on Thursday in a defamation case brought by the country's tourism minister, who claims that Sonko brought accusations of embezzlement without proof. Sonko said that he's being politically persecuted and called for demonstrations this week. Wednesday saw police clash with student protesters in the capital and their fears that this latest unrest could escalate as Sonko's case gets going. Sam Bradpiece brings us more from Dakar. One side hurled rocks and stones, the other launched tear gas. But the police here in Dakar were certainly keen to stop journalists from covering their intervention at the Sher Anta Job University, uh, nestled in the heart of the city. In fact, we witnessed one police officer hit an AFP journalist across the head before bundling him into a police van. The journalist was released about 15 minutes later, but said he received further beatings while inside. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the capital, the main opposition leader, Usman Sonko, was barricaded inside his home by the police and schools were closed out of security concerns. All of this is a worrying precursor ahead of Thursday's trial when Mr Sonko will face a judge in a defamation hearing. The trial has been postponed numerous times uh, because of unrest which has gripped the capital, Dakar, and other parts of the country, but judicial authorities insist that it will go ahead on Thursday. Should Mr Sonko be found guilty in this defamation case, he will be barred from taking part in next year's presidential election. Sam Brad, peace there for us. Now, this week, a UN-backed fact-finding mission in Libya released its final report on human rights in the country. After three years of investigations, the findings are dire. The situation is deteriorating. A wide array of war crimes and crimes against humanity are suspected as having been committed. The perpetrators range from state security forces to the country's Coast Guard to the directorate responsible for dealing with migrants. The victims include migrants and Libyans, the suspected crimes and abuses range from sexual slavery to slavery to torture to murder. The list is long and grim. Many survivors who spoke to the commission risked their safety to do so and have little hope of justice. I'm joined now by Professor Taloka Bayani, one of the investigators of the mission. Professor, thanks so much for speaking to us. Now, um, give me a sense of, of what some of the, the key takeaways were from the three years that you've spent considering the human rights situation in Libya. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you very much. Uh, some of them you've highlighted already. Throughout the course of our investigations, we have found, uh, obviously, patterns of crimes against humanity, torture, forced disappearances, um, detention of migrants in particular. But the highlights of this report uh, are enslavement, especially sexual slavery and forced labor. And what are the conditions that have led to such an array of human rights violations? Contestation for power between different militia groups, um, the question of dissent and suppression in relation to those who uh, challenge the militias and the de facto uh, authorities, uh, denial of the right to self-determination and public participation of Libyan people. You mentioned earlier that migrants were of particular concern. How so? Uh, because of the fact that Libya is a country of transit for migrants uh, from West Africa, East Africa, uh, from, from Afghanistan. And 
the Mediterranean is a gateway to Europe. Uh, and therefore, there's also a policy of interception um, in Libyan waters and pushbacks uh, back to Libya. And so detention, trafficking migrants uh, is big, big business uh, in Libya. It's an entrepreneurial project. And so there were countless abuses against individuals that were documented. Um, is this just a systemic but haphazard fallout from political and social chaos in an unstable country? Or did you also form the, an opinion on whether there was any wider, deliberately strategic campaign against um, human rights in Libya? There's a wider systematic campaign against human rights uh, in Libya. And what we discovered uh, perhaps is just the tip of, of the iceberg. Um, Libyans live under uh, a whole um, threat to their lives, uh, to their fundamental freedoms, and in particular women, not just because of uh, patriarchy, but women are discouraged from uh, participating uh, in political life. We have identified the killings of women, uh, in particular Hanan Barassi, who was killed in 2022, the murder of an MP as well, uh, Sihem Sagiwa. So what, Professor, are your recommendations? What happens after you present your findings to the Human Rights Council on Friday? The uh, findings... Uh, include the preservation of evidence in terms of accountability and responsibility. Uh, we have identified uh, a list of individuals who are responsible and should be held accountable um, you know, for this. Uh, but we have also recommended that there be a further mechanism uh, to establish uh, by the international community, notably the Human Rights Council or the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, and as we speak, I think there's a draft resolution uh, suggesting to establish another mechanism in order to ensure that monitoring human rights violations in Libya uh, is on the spotlight. Thank you so much, Professor Chaluka Biani. They're one of the investigators to the fact-finding mission uh, in Libya that's due to release its findings to the Human Rights Council this Friday. Now, US Vice President Kamala Harris headed out to Tanzania on the second leg of her three-country tour of Africa late on Wednesday. Before leaving Ghana, her last engagement in Accra saw her unveil more than $1 billion in funding to boost women's economic participation on the continent. The money will be directed towards several avenues aimed at supporting African achievement and entrepreneurship. In total, these investments represent more than $1 billion that is being dedicated to advance women's economic participation across the African continent. These investments span from sources that are in the technology sector, financial services sector, and healthcare industries, and will help to do predominantly three things. Help digitize women-owned small businesses and entrepreneurs, provide access to capital health care and education, and combat gender-based violence. Kamala Harris there in Accra before she headed out to Tanzania on Wednesday. Now, in Uganda, a coalition of companies, including heavyweights like Google and Microsoft, have released a statement slamming the country's new homophobic legislation. The Open for Business Coalition has warned that a bill that criminalizes even identifying as LGBTQ, going so far as imposing the death penalty under certain circumstances is economically damaging. The coalition's country director has said that one provision requiring companies to report those even suspected of being LGBTQ puts businesses in an impossible situation. The bill is yet to be signed into law by President Yari Museveni. And finally, in Lagos, a Nigerian artist is harking back to the rhythms of heritage by getting kids to learn the traditional percussion of the Yoruba tribe. Adebayo Ayodeji fears that this aspect of musical history risks falling silent. And so has been running workshops to keep children playing to their ancestral beat. Take a look. On this Lego street corner, adults and children bang away on a variety of traditional African percussion instruments. This drumming workshop is organized by Nigerian artists Adebayo Ayodeji 
a way for the 42-year-old to promote Yoruba culture and educate younger generations. We are using this to revive our culture, our cultural values. Most of them don't, they've not seen this kind of drum before. They've not played it before, and this is an opportunity to introduce them to it. For Ayodeji, who's been playing professionally for 15 years, drums are more than simple instruments. They were traditionally used in weddings and ceremonies to help get in touch with spirits, but also as a tool to communicate between neighboring villages. A central element of Yoruba culture that's slowly sinking into oblivion, but which these parents still hope to pass on to their children. Culture is always it's fluid, it's always transforming. And we have to you know, have um, ways where we can document, we can also archive and also incorporate our children in what we do. For the kids, the workshops are a playful way to learn about their ancestors' cultures and traditions while having a lot of fun. I'm glad that I was able to experience and being able to like play those kind of drums. And I remember he bought me one of those drums when I was younger to play on, and then I broke it. Thanks to initiatives like this one, traditional Yoruba drums aren't likely to go extinct anytime soon. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care. India in the Himalayas. The government is risking everything to speed up economic development. Hydroelectric dams, motorways, railways, a massive impact on a region already hard hit by numerous ecological catastrophes. This is disastrous, what we are making. Watch Himalayas, the climate ticking bomb in reporters on France 24 and France24.com.